two, one. Uh, friends, welcome uh, to our monthly talk about the Baha'i faith and the, how, how the Baha'i faith relates to the issues that are all around us in the world today. But before we do that, we're going to say opening prayer, which will be read by Riyaz Masroor. Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavor and grant them strength to serve thee. O oh God, leave them not to themselves, but guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily, thou art a helper and their Lord. Baha'u'llah. Thank you, dear friends. And once again, welcome all. I want to point out that this talk is on Zoom and it is also being broadcast on YouTube. For those of you that are on Zoom, if you have any questions, please, please write them in the chat section and we'll try to get them to Dr. Our speaker Thank one you. at a time. For those of you that are on YouTube, you don't have the ability to ask questions, but I will give you, give you my cell number. Please text those questions to me and I will read them out to Dr. Ranjbar at the end of his talk. So if you're on YouTube, my phone number is 281-788-8255. Two eight one seven eight eight zero three eight zero. 788 Friends, it's wonderful to have Dr. Ranjbar to talk to us today. And I'm, I'm, I have to admit that I'm fascinated by his topic. I'm fascinated by what he is about to say. Because you see, dear friends, Dr. Ranjbar is a scientist. And over the last 100 years, 150 years, belief in God and belief in religion has been disappearing from our world. There are fewer and fewer people involved with religion, involved with God, involved with church or whatever. And so to have a real scientist who believes in God and believes in religion and wishes to talk about religion, it's amazing. It's fascinating. It's exciting. So I'm delighted to welcome a real scientist in this group, Dr. Vahid Ranjbar. Uh, what happened? Okay. Uh, by way of introduction, Dr. Ranjbar is a research physicist working at the Brookhaven National Lab. His field of research is spin and beam dynamics for which he has published extensively and is a reviewer for the American Physical Society's Physical Review Journal. He is currently leading the development of the electron injector complex for the future electron ion collider. Prior to this, he worked on the RHIC collider and AGS machines at Brookhaven, and before that at Fermi Labs, Tevatron. He grew up living in Tanzania, India, Pakistan, and in the US, and spent three years studying physics in Novos. Bursk, Russia. He's occasional contributor to the BahaiTeachings.com magazine and writes on subjects related to science and religion. Having said all that, dear friends, I must admit that what I just read to you, I didn't understand a word of what I was reading. Uh, but here's Dr. Wahid Ranjbar to talk about materialism and the fall of religion. It's all yours, Wahid. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, your community in, in inviting me to, uh, to give this uh, talk today. I will uh, start by sharing a, a PowerPoint I've prepared for this. And uh, so 
like he said, basically my, my talk here is going to be about uh, the materialism and, and the fall of uh, religion. And I think if you begin by considering the past uh, 200 years of history, it is easy to see that uh, something truly uh, momentous happened during the 19th century. And this something is, is something that changed every aspect of life on this planet. It unleashed wonderful and terrible powers. These powers have allowed humans to actually touch another world and yet are capable of driving the next mass extinction or ending life as, as we know it. If you look at uh, any metric of uh, human activity, from population to economic, uh, scientific, artistic, or literary output over time, it's difficult to miss the inflection point that, that one observes in, in the 19th century. Every aspect of human society has been upended from looking at race, class, gender roles to political structures. The process of the Anthropocene itself which is this, what scientists basically refer to as this process that's leading to this mass extinction event on the planet is also clearly traceable to the events which occurred during the 19th century, as you can kind of see clearly on this chart. So the failure to adequately address these challenges caused by this event has been manifesting itself in this convulsion of the, of the whole world and which has seized really all the life uh, on our planet. And in particular, if you consider uh, the role of uh, major religions in addressing the questions uh, which have uh, been raised by this event, you see what we see is basically the rise of materialism. And this is due really, I think, to the failure of religions to address these questions. It's common really for uh, many religious individuals and spiritually minded people to worry about the corrosive rise of materialism. An example of this is an excerpt uh, from a, a sermon uh, given by the late Billy uh, Graham, where he explained that materialism has become the god of too many of us. It is that state in which material possessions are elevated to the central place in life and receive the attention due to God alone. The Bible teaches that preoccupation with material possessions is an idolatry, and it, and it poisons every other phase of our life, including our family life. We are reaping what we have sown for several generations. America is at least in part suffering the consequences of our selfish preoccupation with material things, especially since World War II, to the neglect of moral and spiritual values. So materialism really has many faces. You have maybe philosophical uh, view of materialism, which basically represents a reduction of humanity and all things to the chance operation of matter following mindless physical laws. Then you can also have materialism from a social relationship, uh, which re basically involves valuing material objects or wealth over human values, such as mercy, kindness, and love. And really, when you look at the, the rise of materialism itself, often it's been linked in the past or blamed on this growing authority of rational scientific thought. However, I think a more careful study shows that such a materialistic view is not a given consequence of rational scientific thought. Although science is based on objective and testable material facts, this materialistic view is not a foregone conclusion. And there are all other views, for example, Platonic and, or what may be called Pythagorean type of idealism that remain a growing and compelling description of nature. The core premise of this sort of idealism is that material existence is ultimately founded upon non-physical abstractions or mathematical forms. And this is contrary to the materialistic view. 
The most popular and clearest expression of this originates in, in, in the West, originates uh, with ancient Greek philosophy, uh, in particular Plato's theory of forms. What is rarely considered, however, is the role that religious uh, materialism might rightly carry uh, for the, the cause of this rise in materialism. Its role in this process, I think, rests on the apparent hard split between science and religion, which manifested itself most clearly by the middle of the 19th century. It was at this time when this new theory of evolution and the geological sciences were casting profound doubt on the literal understanding of scriptural accounts of creation, and particularly the age of the earth and the origin of humans. Of course, it's common to cast this rise of scientific materialism and the theory of evolution as some primary cause of this split between science and religion. But I would argue that really it is religious materialism that shares more blame. And what I mean by that is that in religious theology, this materialistic premise rests on this insistence of the physicality or materiality of things which are properly metaphysical or spiritual. So for example, if you look at heaven, hell, angels, the resurrection, the narration of creation, they're all taken as physical facts instead of their obvious metaphysical or spiritualist uh, understanding. It could be said that mainstream religion's insistence on the materialistic understanding of these ideas made belief completely untenable for rational scientific thought. Thus, the rejection of idealism in both religious and scientific thought made the reconciliation between the two an absolute impossibility. This literalist, materialistic view of religion is common in all of the Abrahamic religions. In Christianity, it takes the form of the insistence that the heaven which Christ ascended was a physical heaven, or that angels are creatures which fly around in the physical world, or that the seeing, hearing, death, life, and the grave that are discussed as metaphors in scriptures are in fact common physical things. In Islam, a similar tendency developed, such that the paradise and heaven and hell, the day of judgment and resurrection were understood in gross literal terms. So that paradise really represented some simple deferment of physical pleasures to the afterlife where all of them would be, all the desires would be satisfied. Of course, such a view did not pass without criticism. You have, for example, the famous Persian poet and mathematician Omar Khayyam in the Rubaiyat he observed the moral bankruptcy of avoiding these lusts simply to indulge them in some imagined afterlife. If you look at it uh, the, historically, though, you can, you can kind of see in Christianity in particular that this materialistic view might be traceable to the fourth century AD. In 399 AD in Egypt, you have the occurrence of a large mob of Alexandrian monks who rioted over an early, the, the understanding of an early church father who was called Origen and his uh, Neoplatonic theology. In particular, his teaching that God was incorporeal. This caused the, the, the local patriarch or Pope uh, Theophilius of Alexandria to publicly change his theological position towards Origen and denounce him. Over two so-called Origenist crises, the theology of origin was eventually declared heretical by Justinian I, the Byzantium emperor, and he ordered that all his works be burned. The theology put forward by Origen uh, emphasized the spiritual aspects of Christianity, especially in the allegorical understanding of Genesis. He claimed that some of the biblical texts had no literal meaning and were to be only understood allegorically. He also understood that logos was the rational, or word as it was used in the Bible, was the rational creative force of the universe, which illuminates rational thought and guides us to the truth. 
just 19 years after the first riots over Origen's theology, these same Christian monks of Alexandria would drag the famous female academic Hypatia off her chariot, strip her naked and beat her to death, and finally burn her body outside the city walls. Hypatia was the famous female lecturer of mathematics, astronomy, and Neoplatonism at the University of Alexandria. She was the daughter of the mathematician Theon, the last professor of the University of Alexandria. This event itself came on the heels of Pope Cyril's ascent to power after the death of his uncle, Theophilus, in 1412. In 1414, Cyril began a campaign against the Jewish community in Alexandria, closing all the synagogues, confiscating property, and expelling the community from the city. After murdering Hypatia, the Christian mob went on to burn down the university under orders of Cyril. He was later declared a saint by the church. And this event has been seen by many to be a watershed event marking the end of the classical period, the rise of religious intolerance and the descent into the dark ages. Origen himself, was a student of Amenaeus in the Platonic Academy in Alexandria, and thus was part of the new movement in philosophy at the time, which later became known as Neoplatonism. Plotinus, the most famous Neoplatonic philosopher, was also a student of Amenaeus, and he taught that there was a supremely transcendent one beyond multiplicities of categories of being and non-being. The one was comparable to a divine sun, a primal will and intellect from which all things emanated like rays of light. Yet like the sun was itself never diminished by these emanations. The rise of Neoplatonism also coincided with the rise of Christianity in late antiquity. And there was some speculation that Plotinus himself might have been a lapsed Christian. Thus we see that Neoplatonism undoubtedly influenced and was probably itself shaped by Christian thought. This seems especially so when you look at the Gospel of John, which was written itself about 90 to uh, between 90 to 110 AD. A reading of the opening passage from the Gospel of John shows that it's almost purposely making use of concepts which would later characterize Neoplatonism. For example, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. Here the term word was translated from Greek word logos, which had a definite and clear Neoplatonic meaning. In Plotinus's view, logos was that first emanation from the one. This concept of logos appears to owe its genesis to the Jewish theologian and philosopher Philo of Alexandria, whose concept of logos is linked to the conception of the first begotten son of God. Such was the resonance of Philo's theology with Christian themes that many later Christians assumed he was an early father of the church. And this was in large part why his corpus of works were preserved and revered by Christians. While some scholars suspect that Philo's the theological treatment of logos itself and biblical allegory informed both St. Paul's development of early Christian theology and even the Gospel of John itself, which were written well after Philo's work. Origen's later fall from favor, both in the Eastern and Western church doctrine, can be seen as indicative of Christianity's drift towards a materialistic or physical theology and a herald of the ensuing dark ages in Europe. Now, if we look at Islam, we see a similar type of pivot that happened, a descent into literalism that occurred around the 11th century, and along with it, an ensuing decline in its dominance in science. It can be argued that divorced of idealism, the Quran is un unintelligible. Here, the Gospel of John, here, as in the Gospel of John, the creativity and mysticism of the word is central. In fact, the Quran repeats the description of Jesus as the word of God used in John. Early on, Islamic philosophers studied, adapted, and 
uh, developed Hellenistic Neoplatonism. You have philosophers like Al-Kindi, later Al-Farabi and Avicenna, who carried forward Platonic philosophy, and as well as contributing to the development of science, math, and medicine. However, by the 11th century, you have the philosopher Al-Ghazali, the Persian philosopher and theologian who turned sharply against Neoplatonism. He insisted on the concept of a bodily resurrection, the physical pleasures and pain of heaven and hell. He also insisted on a form of theological occasionalism, the belief that all causal events and interactions are the product of the immediate and present will of God and not due to any physical ideas of causality. Today, in Orthodox Islamic theology, like in Christianity, they take this concept of resurrection as physical bodily reality, especially as it applies to the day of judgment. As in Christianity, this materialistic understanding also leads them to take heaven and hell as literal. The prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, in one of his most important theological works, known as the Book of Certitude, elaborates on the symbolism of both the Quran and the Bible. He explains the meaning of the terms resurrection, the day of judgment, heaven, stars, and clouds. And these were commonly understood to represent actual physical things. Yet he elaborates how these words must have symbolic and metaphorical meaning for them to have any logical consistency. For example, he explains, and now comprehend the meaning of this verse. The whole earth shall on the resurrection day be but his handful, and in his right hand shall the heavens be folded together. Praise be to him, and high be he uplifted above the partners they join with them. And now be fair in thy judgment. Were this verse to have the meaning with which men suppose it to have, of what profit, one may ask, could it be to man? Moreover, it is evident and manifest that no such hand could be seen by human eye, could accomplish such deeds, or could possibly be ascribed to the exalted essence of the one true God. Nay, to acknowledge such a thing is not but sheer blasphemy, an utter perversion of the truth. And in another uh, connection, he goes, on the contrary, the term earth is meant the earth of understanding and knowledge, and by heavens, the heaven of divine revelation. Reflect thou how in the one hand he hath in his mighty grasp turned the earth of knowledge and understanding previously unfolded into a mere handful, and on the other spread out a new highly exalted earth in the hearts of men, thus causing the freshest and loveliest blossoms and the mightiest and loftiest of trees to spring forth from the illumined bosom of man. Baha'u'llah also goes on uh, in the Tablet of Wisdom to elaborate further on the nature of the word of God or logos. He explains, Know thou, moreover, that the word of God, exalted be his glory, is higher and far superior to that which the senses can perceive. For it is sanctified from any property or substance. It transcendeth limitations of known elements and is exalted above all the essential and recognized substances. It became manifest without any syllable or sound and is none but the command of God which pervadeth all created things. It hath never been withheld from the world of being. It is God's all pervasive grace from which all grace doth emanate. It is an entity far removed above all that hath been and shall be. And later, everything must needs have an origin, every builder building a builder. Verily the word of God is the cause which hath preceded the contingent world a word, world which is adorned with the splendors of the ancient of days, yet is being renewed and regenerated at all times. So we can see through this lens that now the gospel of John's version of the word 
presents a version of creation which is in much more in a much more abstract manner and one that can be understood as very complementary to modern understandings of the nature of the rise of order and origins. Here, creation is now linked to the operation of the word of God. Thus, one can say that the primal order of the universe comes from the operation of what we might call creative information. Because what is a word? It's a container for information. And this might be considered definitional for the term logos or word of God. This information exists potentially eternally, just as the number three or the geometry of a circle exists. Abdul Baha, the son and appointed interpreter of Baha'u'llah's revelation, goes on to implicitly uh, uh, indict really the, the failure of the rationalism in theology as being responsible for much of the problems of the present age and the violence that, that exists in society. When over a century ago, he predicted when religion shorn of its superstitions, traditions, and unintelligent dogmas shows its conformity with science, then there will be a great unifying cleansing force in the world, which will sweep before it all wars, disagreements, discords, and struggle. And then will mankind be united in the power of the love of God. So that concludes my uh, uh, prepared presentation. If there are any uh, questions or things that people wanted to ask about. Can you comment about religion's inability to do, you know, there's always this version in the South that people dressed in their Sunday best before they went out lynching other pe Black people. There's always this notion of me sending my children to school and telling them, don't hang out with those people, they're not good people. And my children coming home and saying, they're just like me, they're, they're no different. That what we are teaching our children in terms of religion is the reason why they're rejecting religion. Can you comment on that notion? Yes, uh, I think that's entirely true. And I think this has been going on uh, for over a millennia. And, and this, is, this is, I think, the fundamental issue, in my opinion, is that in religion, they have this mistaken notion of what faith is. And so for them, for, for most people, people kind of equate in their idea of faith with blind belief. And these two concepts are really not, not the same. Faith uh, does not mean blind belief or shouldn't. And now part of this was, I think, you know, these institutions, these religions didn't want to have any challenge to their authority. Now, one of the things that, you know, Baha'u'llah teaches is actually the opposite, is that actually we, when you're, the first step that a person needs to do is actually be detached from what they believe to kind of uh, open up your heart and to be detached from, you know, Baha'u'llah says in the opening uh, passages of the, the Kitab Igan, the book of certitude, he said uh, basically that, no, uh, that, that you need to detach yourself from all that is in heaven and all that is on earth. I'm, I'm paraphrasing here. And so this is actually very similar to, I think in Kant's you know, view when he was talking about enlightenment where he was also talking about how you should dare to know, how you should needs to be, you need to be uh, uh, basically uh, arrive at your own conclusions and uh, by yourself. And uh, I think religion rejected this idea that that you need the first question. There, there's this rejection of questioning, 
Yet this is, I think, absolutely essential uh, to question before one can reach, reach faith. And so it just became blind imitation. Uh, and, and, and that blind imitation, I think, was maybe mostly stable for, for uh, maybe a millennia. But until around the 19th century, when basically uh, science uh, rose up and, and just basically cast all of these things, uh, a big question mark over all of these things, these, these, these uh, social structures began to collapse. And then basically you had a, a kind of uh, anarchy uh, uh, arise. But what I think Baha'u'llah teaches us is that we have to question. Uh, but then there's a next step beyond questioning. One has to question, but then one must now turn one's heart and, and then use these capacities that God has given us, which is the capacity to perceive. I think it basically boils down to this this idea that we that that distrust human human humans ability spiritual capacity to recognize the truth and uh, this is something that we need to have faith in is that once we remove the, these barriers and allow people to question and allow people to to ask question and not not scream oh they don't have faith uh, once you allow them to do that then then we should trust that then they can use those spiritual capacities uh, to, to basically clean this attachment and these prejudices that we have. Once we've got rid of these prejudices, human beings will recognize spiritual truths uh, very clearly. Uh, but it's that final step that, that people are afraid, to, afraid to, to go into. So I think this applies to maybe what happened, you know, well, in the case you're citing, like in, in, the, in the South, you know. People kind of reduced religion to just kind of blind uh, following of these patterns and that this, this amounted to belief. You follow these patterns, you follow this type of, and people would get excited because they, they have this sense of group belonging, the sense of cultural heritage. And they, I think they would mistake that for belief, but that's not real belief. I think Christ describes what belief is. This is the second birth. And this requires first, I think, putting at risk your ideas and your conceptions, putting those things at risk, and then stepping forward to embrace and, and recognize uh, the truth that, that, that God has given you. Other questions? Anybody have any thoughts they wish to share either on uh, Zoom or YouTube? I'm shocked there's such a quiet audience today. Oh, I'm holding uh, back. <laughs> who? I loved everything you said. <laughs> it's just, it just wonderful. And then if you want, raise your hand. Um, there you go. Can, uh, Brian, can, can you comment on um, the distinction between um, science and technology. I think there's a lot of confusion over what science is. Um, it, it, you know, as, as much, uh, if not more, uh, no, nah, I wouldn't say that, uh, over what, uh, as to what religion is. Um, and that might be part of the problem. But uh, everything you've said, I, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I have- So wonderful. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Out loud, you know. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. I, I think that uh, one way I think you can view, I like to view science is basically this uh, process of, of uh, developing models which allow us to make predictions. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that's basically what it is, that beat chance, you know, and the better those models are, then the better our science is, yep. you know? And I think, yeah, did you want to say something to that? It's about making predictions, yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah that's, that's uh, as, um, there's a lot of, when, when people, when you hear science, the, um, the, the layman hears science, the word science, they, they, they confuse, I think, um, pure science uh, with applied science and technology. And then where it's just the difference between Edison and uh, and Einstein, you know. 
Um, whereas uh, Einstein uh, wasn't interested in making money off, you know, off his uh, off his science, or you know, like he was. I'm sure he was interested in and being able to eat and you know, yeah. <laughs> stay alive. But uh, whereas uh, Edison uh, was very much interested in uh, the application and uh, and, and and profit from. Uh, he, he would, no one would call Edison a, a pure a, a pure scientist, um, or and uh, and Einstein was was certainly wasn't an engineer. But uh, when but when we hear the word science, uh, I I think I, I suspect the average person thinks technology, and that might be part of the problem you know, when it comes to talking about the uh, harmony between. Science. Yeah, I, I think uh, part of the, the question of the harmony between science and, and, and religion boils down to kind of maybe two, two basic questions. I've, I've been thinking about this. And uh, the first question uh, which people bring up when they kind of think of science is that they, they kind of reject uh, they think that science is basically leading them to reject the existence of anything which is transcendent of space and time. That they think that, that oh, well, science is telling us that everything is just material things which are bopping around and that there's nothing that can possibly exist that is transcendent of, of, of space and time or existence of eternal form or anything like that. And I think that uh, Plato's theory of forms and mathematics itself basically puts a lie to that. Uh, actually, I, I see that math, I, I think that the, the actually tr science tells is basically demonstrating the opposite of this, is that, is that there exists, the fact that science is so successful and is able to construct these mathematical models that are so good at making predictions, that tells us that there is something there that's abstract. Because what, what you're dealing with in mathematics is you're dealing with these abstract eternal forms, which are these, these relationships which exist. And those are eternal. They exist. They, 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 are, they, they are forms that transcend uh, their, locate, their specific location in space and time. They're, they're always there. I mean, the, you know, th these laws of mathematics are always true. And and so, so, I was, so I think from that point of view, you can see this is clearly not true, that there is this. However, there's another aspect that people will take issue with also uh, with science uh, saying, well, science must reject religion. And this relates to the idea of causality. So in, yes. in, in, in science, many people will say, oh, well, we know that everything that occurs, occurs for a physical reason. So there's no room for divine causes, right? So you say that it, you can trace every action. People imagine actually that in physics and in, in, in science that, that you're basically, we're able to reduce everything to these really strict physical laws. And they tell us, you know, A hits B, B hits C. And so everything, everything about you, your personality is predetermined by these deterministic trajectories which come out. And so there's really no room where, where's, where's a God or a will going to exist in this mechanism, let alone a human will, you know, they all agree with, you know, some people argue that even the idea that there's a self is some kind of illusion. Uh, and what I would say to that is that's actually not true. We don't believe that there is, there is a deterministic part of science that we know exists, but there is also uh, this other part of science, which explicitly says it's not deterministic, or at least it doesn't appear to be deterministic. This maybe is an open philosophical question. So for example, in quantum mechanics, you have events which are deterministic, but then there are events uh, which, which occur, which are clearly not determined. They cannot be predicted. They, we call it random. Well, there are random occurrences. Now, when we say something is random, what we're really saying is we don't have a model. We don't have a way to predict this. So the fact that there exists some random, that there exists randomness, just means we use this word. It means that we just don't know what is causing it. We don't have a, a, a way to explain its behavior. So there again, so if you're a religious person, you might believe that 
Well, this is the will of God. Since if you're religious, you know, you're kind of classical, like Abrahamic religion, you believe nothing occurs without the will of God. So this must be an, some expression of the will of God. And what's fascinating is that you actually need this type of randomness for order to emerge in the universe. All uh, from evolution, you need random mutation for things to occur. From the very origin of the universe, we, you know, you know, physicists and some people uh, kind of believe, well, they have to kind of, the only thing they're left with is these random quantum fluctuations of the, the vacuum that leads to the appearance of the order that we have. And that's, that's what many, you know, appeal to. Uh, so it's from this that order, order has to, has to emerge. Yeah, there's a uh, lot of, like, uh, that sort of, that's a materialistic, <laughs> there's a, I would consider that a materialistic interpretation of, uh, of, and really kind of a very limited uh, understanding of, uh, Not, not to say that uh, these guys don't have a better understanding of, uh, of the mathematics and the application of, uh, of that science, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, that it's almost like saying that uh, this, the, the theory can't, you know, uh, you know is, is just, just needs a little bit of, you know, a refinement. Uh, <laughs> no, but there's this. <laughs> it's obviously has, yeah. has some, some serious, um, but I can't. It's really. I. I think it's important to to under. I understand that. I believe that there are a lot of closeted religious scientists. It's just that if you ask them if they believe in religion, you're almost asking like, if you believe in this interpretation or this definition of God or uh, or, or religion?" And of course not. It's 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 you know and. Unless you grew up with it, and uh, unless you will, uh, which uh, no uh, tr true scientist would, you would say no, no, I don't believe in that that stuff. I, you know, I believe in science. And, but, well, what science? Okay, well, that, I think that that's that's part of the problem is that uh, religion has become hijacked and identified with this materialistic understanding, which is completely nonsensical. You can't be you just can't be a practicing scientist and and believe that the earth is made in six days or, or, or stuff like you just can't do that you know you're not there there's there's no the rationalize uh, the, the worst kind of behavior yeah. yeah it's 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 and you're right it's it's thousands of years it, yeah. uh, um it's been that way for thousands of years um yeah, there was a movie about hypatia uh a, f a few years ago that uh yeah, there was. It was uh, I think it's called uh, Alien or something like that. Yeah, didn't get a, a lot of attention. Could have been a better movie, maybe. Anyway, uh, but I just, uh, I, I, you know, I loved everything you said because I, I, I uh, sure as a uh, physics and math, mathematics teacher, I, 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 I almost want to, um, uh, you know, bring it up. Uh, as it, you know, that listen, you know, this is this is so much. Students look at the, what they're learning as okay. This is a way I can make some money, or this is a way. Uh, this is going to allow me to have. A, uh, no, it, it's it, 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 it's it's good for your soul. <laughs> it, being able to reason allows you to approach God. Um, um, Doctor Ranchbird, there's a question on Zoom that I want to ask you. Sure. It says, is materialism increasingly converting more people away from God or just from organized religion? Does the distinction matter? I uh, actually, I, I, don't, I don't know if I have the answer to that question, but my hunch is that actually both is happening. Uh, I, I think you, are, you do have some people who are rejecting organized religion. Uh, and that's been going on for a long time. But I think more recently, there are many that are have basically uh, kind of buying into maybe the, the new atheists uh, thing and viewing that this, this whole project and whole idea of God is some kind of delusion and, uh, um, you know, Bronze Age, uh, you know, nonsense uh, that, 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 that we're subscribing to. Uh, so you, um, I, yeah. hope maybe sometime in in the 
actually see a really quick study. <laughs> Did you research uh, Newton's um, uh, approach to religion? Um, he would have, uh, his, his beliefs were heretical. Um, did I say it right? You know, uh, but um, he was a very religious person. Uh, and, you know, as, as far as determinism is concerned and atheism or atheistic de determinism, uh, uh, you could say it has its source in Newtonian mechanics. But uh, Newton, atheist, he, uh, he spent, wrote more on, uh, on, on the Bible uh, than he did on, uh, on, on physics. Uh, on, uh, so, um, and I don't know that m the majority of people uh, know that, you know, um, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost certain that the majority of people know that, uh, don't know that, you know, that he was a, uh, almost a fanatic, you know, uh, religiously, you know. Um, and, you know, not to say he was perfect in his beliefs, but uh, no, he, he. All right. Uh... Pat O'Brien, ask your question, but you have to oh. unmute yourself. Oh, I, I, I forgot my question. I, I fell into the, into the <laughs> information here. You know, I, I was thinking though, as the, the doctor was talking, if, if within the different dispensations, uh, I mean, I, I got in a little bit late and so I was there in, with you in Alexandria. I don't know what occurred before, but it, it so has, in every dispensation, we've we've had this kind of Neoplatonic, uh, you know, the, the the forms, the forms and the shapes, the shadows. There's a a, a, re, a reality that speaks to larger to to the things that cannot be understood unless you kind of suspend your observations. Has has that always been the case in religions, and has there always been? Uh, in the face of, you know, folks who look, look at look at what the prophet says or what the prophet's disciples say, and then, you know, they go off and, you know, create their own mutation of, of the religion. Yeah, I, I, it seems that way. I mean, I, you know, we have a few data points here. So we have, uh, actually, you, you have Christianity, which I mentioned, you have Islam, which I mentioned, kind of these things happen. And you have actually even in uh, even pagan religion and, you know, the kind of something similar sort of happened there uh, where you have like uh, kind of people uh, where, where we had the, the idea, of, I, I guess what Platonism does is it kind of allows, it, it really has functioned, I think, as this bridge between a harmonizing theological beliefs or spiritual beliefs with with uh, scientific or uh, you know scientific belief or philosophical beliefs and it, it's this nice bridge between the two and it actually i think if you look at its origin is really in 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 you know pre uh, uh christian thought with the pagans it, it was function it functioned in that way you know kind of it kind of began with the you know before plato this kind of ideas of, of god and then he kind of said no no it's more abstract than this and he even introduced the idea of an ultimate god but then there's these deities that that existed and uh, so there so there there's that business going on and i think then you saw in christianity also they were using uh, with philo you know before him he kind of also introduced the idea where he took this platonism and he really uh went after the bible you know, he was Jewish and he went after the Bible and kind of explained it in all allegorical terms and symbolic terms and, and you know, appealed to, to kind of reconciling it with, with kind of contemporary rationalist thought. And then you had that carried forward in Christianity and then in Islam with like people like Avicenna and, and so on. So it seems to be a pattern here, but I don't know how far back that goes. Uh, I don't know enough about what was going on in uh, I know a little bit, but I, I can't speak authoritatively to it. What was going on in, in like the the Vedic and the Hindu uh, uh, tradition? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think they were already more in, in line with the idealistic kind of that's really embedded in there. So that wasn't as big of a challenge for them. But I, I can't speak, speak to that with too much authority. Yeah. Th thanks. Thanks for that. I did have one thought on the the science. Is it science we see, or is it technology that we see? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I think I think now we're we're just pretty much overwhelmed, you know, uh, with 
you know, what we're doing right now is evidence of that. And, you know, I've got, I've got uh, a 10 year old grandson and he, he is, a, he's definitely a, a, a digital native, you know, for sure. So, so the idea of, of science, I think is really rather confused today. We, in, we, we see it and it's it, the utility of an invention or some adaptation comes to market. It, it seems almost minute by minute. I know it's not that way. And so we see these things. It, it, it seems to appear that the, the technology itself will, will have the power to enlighten us because it will answer so many questions so directly. And it seems to be advancing more than our own discipline of thinking or our critical, the critical aspects of how we view the world. And I, I think folks, folks don't look at the notion of science or as uh, 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 David uh, Wright was saying uh, at mathematics and, and see kind of the, the what, it, what would you call it, the purity of it or, or the essence of it. You know, what they know is they have a new app. What they know is that they can now park their car by clapping their hands or using a, you know, a key fob or something. Uh, this, this doesn't allow people, I think, to really reflect on, oh, it's, it's science, it's science. And here we're trying to say science and religion agree. And they're kind of saying, well, there's religion and that's fun on Sunday. But look at all the rewards. Look at all the you, yeah, utility. Look at what I get out of technology. Mm. How, why am I going to waste my uh, time with? So just uh, a thought. Yeah, it's, it's a... I have a question, Dr. Ranjbar. Mm -hmm. Are scientists, pure scientists, mostly atheists and against religion, or most scientists Believers of some kind believe in religion. How would you say? But I don't know. You know, I have I have a, my own segment of the community I I kind of belong to, and uh, I would have to say that probably most of the people are are atheists or agnostic. Uh, you do have a few who uh, you know have some spiritual leanings. They may be interested in like you know, uh, Hinduism or some other things. Uh, um, I'm sure there's some, you know, Christians, uh, but they're a minor, they're minority, uh, basically, at, at, at least that's my, been my observation. I have a comment uh, about, uh, let's see, yes, Donnie's question concerning material materialism. And my comment was that is commercialism, commercialism seducing people to the point where they are striving for more material thing in the materialism nature and in that in striving to get more I think commercialism is seducing people and causing them to want more material things and thus pulling them further away from God. Can someone come in on that? Yeah, I think that's that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> you know, is uh, but that's uh, that's part of the objectification that I think has happened. When th there's an interesting uh, set of philosophers uh, that appeared uh, around, called known as the Frankfurt School, who basically uh, there were some these German Marxists. Uh, who showed up around uh, the interwar period and then also actually post-war. And their, their argument uh, was basically that this uh, technology and the science, what they called the, they attribute to the enlightenment thinking, was basically being used and turned on humanity to objectify them and to turn them into products, to sell them stuff, and to basically you know, it was, it was just destroying kind of the, the, the soul, the soul of humanity. Now these guys were all atheists. So they didn't, they didn't believe, believe in this, but I think that, that, that initial uh, premise 
was uh, was actually spot on. And uh, and this is the problem, I think, is that when you have science, which gives you these powers and gives you this ability to to control and manipulate, you know, things and to that that without without spirituality, without religion or more the morality behind it can be used to objectify human beings and be turned against us. I mean, we see this with the kind of social media, how people are being treated and manipulated like like uh, rats in a maze, you know, because they can poke different buttons and make you behave the way that you want to behave. And uh, that's just this this objectification of human beings. And that's be they, they, they do this because there's no realization of the, the transcendence of, of human beings. And so you get in this reinforcing uh, spiral down, I think, like you're talking about, people becoming more and more materialistic. Yeah, um, yeah I, 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 I just, uh, I, you see, I don't really see a, a difference um, of pure science uh, and religion. Um, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in essence, and uh, really, uh, oh, you're, you're mute for some reason, Vahid. Um Sorry, I was just uh, muting so that people could talk. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I, I just, I just, I find that anybody could be a hardcore, I don't know, atheist or a hard, you know, or uh, Uh, I mean, uh, 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 it, 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 it's 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 really it's very sad that uh, it's become such a uh, it's uh, such a, uh, a chaotic debate uh, instead of uh, uh, um, I don't know I get, I'm trying to think of a, a question that I know you can answer if I could just get it out, <laughs> um, but. Um, science and technology, there's a lot of abuse right now of bad science. Uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, would you agree that, um, I, I mean, we're, we're, what, what people are looking for is a rationalization of whatever behavior, um, you know, they, they happen to, you know, uh, to be, uh, to, uh, to, to, to have, you know, uh, and, I, and I, whether it's science or whether it's religion, there's a tw there are twisted in biological science, especially, but uh, 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 um, uh, social science and so forth. Um, and um, and I think what we're we're talking about in terms of, uh, uh, of religion uh, so often, and I don't know, maybe uh, hopefully you can you can you can comment on this. Um, uh, is is that um, the, the, these misinterpretations of what religion is. Uh, uh, as as Baha'is, we, we, we know that uh, when we speak of God, uh, we're all, we can't speak of God without, um, without speaking uh, of the manifestation of God, because are we referring to uh, what we know uh, through the manifestation, or are we referring to some sort, some tradition or philosophy, or you know? And uh, there's another. Th that's another thing we 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 have we, when we speak of religion and God is that we we cannot see or, or speak of uh, God without um, without bringing up the manifestation of God, which is the source of our, our, our of these words. I don't know, I'm just hoping you, I could get you to talk more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Vahid, uh, so much of pagan religion and, and Abraham mystic religions also involve divine intervention, miracles. Right. Uh, how do we, how do science explain those things and how do we as Baha'is accept them? So uh, I, that's what I was kind of getting at when I was talking about this, then the non-deterministic type of physics, which, which we know is, 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 exists. So, you know, as, as you know, probably with Baha'is, uh, 
we tend to downplay miracles uh, in the sense that this is not really the true evidence that people need to base their belief off of because, you know, unless you witness it, uh, it's really not evidence uh, for you. And even then, I mean, you can use the example of, well, is this a manifestation of uh, someone's higher technology or, or, and does that necessarily translate into spiritual authority? Uh, so there's that question too. Uh, so, I mean, you, the silly example would be like, well, okay, what if, what if uh, Christ were to appear uh, today in the heavens and the clouds exactly as we, we predicted it? How would we really know that this was indeed uh, the spiritual being we, we know as Christ and not some advanced technological being? I mean, how would you tell the difference? Uh, and uh, you wouldn't. Uh, if you base your perception on these type of things. Uh, so uh, so Baha'is, you know, like to appeal towards this, the spiritual capacity of people and not these physical manifestations of miraculous things. But having said that, we still acknowledge that there does, miracles can occur. Uh, it is within God's purview to, to uh, perform things which seem to defy the laws uh, of nature. And I, as a, sci as, as a uh, physicist, I would say that, well, uh, there's room for that <laughs> in, in current phys phys physics, because there is a level of non-determinism that exists. Uh, it's possible. Basically anything is kind of possible, but within a certain, with a low probability, you know, and a vanishing probability. So it is possible. So miracles can exist and, and do exist on, on some level, but uh, mostly they don't occur, uh, I guess, you know, or maybe they do occur. That's, that's God's will. So, you know, it depends on your perspective. So I guess that would be my, my response to the, the question of miracles. Is an addictiveness to miracles or the want of a miracle and behavior? Does anybody else have questions? I'm sorry, I'm kind of cutting in here. Anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Comments? Uh, I guess I've I think we didn't get any comments or questions on YouTube, uh, Dr. Ranjbar. So uh, this is all of us now here. Uh, okay. I really, truly wonderful presentation. I mean, there are not enough words to describe. I really, really enjoyed this and I really learned a lot. And um, I'll send you a message email so you can perhaps if you want to share this presentation because I'm going to steal some of your stuff use okay. it at some other point uh, also for those of you that are still here I want to remind you that one of Dr. Ranjbar's neighbors from New Jersey is going to be our next speaker and her name is Julia Berger you probably know her Dr. Julia Berger has, uh, is a professor at the Department of Religion at Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. But for many years, she has worked with the Baha'i, as you, many of you might know, that the Baha'i Faith is a permanent NGO, non-governmental organization presence at the United Nations. And her talk will be Rethinking Religion and Social Transformation insights from the Baha'i community's engagement with the United Nations. So it's what 70 years since the United Nations was formed, we have been working with the United Nations to advance some of the things that we believe in, women's rights, race, equality of all races, environmental justice. And she has worked with the United Nations for years. And she's going to tell us what we as Baha'is have achieved working with the United Nations. Um, exciting speaker, Julia Berger, you guys will enjoy it. And it's February the 4th. I will send out reminders about it. And I hope most of you, and if not all of you, will show up to hear Dr. Berger speak. Dr. Ranjbar, comments, final comments, thoughts? 
Well, I'm excited to listen to that talk that uh, Julia that you you mentioned. I think I've I've heard a lot about her, so that should be exciting. Good. I'll send you the I'll send you the link. I will absolutely send you the link. You should please please do join us. And again, thank you so very much for taking the time. I know you're a busy man, so this was wonderful that you took the time to join us tonight. Thank you and, for inviting me. It was really a pleasure. Uh, and I'll let you know what comments come on our YouTube page. I'm sure the comments will come after we're done. Much Anybody? La last questions? Yeah. Going Just, once. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank <laughs> Wonderful you, presentation. Thank you all. Good night. Good night. Good night.